You mentioned in one of our previous episodes an interesting study out of Israel looking at probiotics during or after an antibiotic uh, course. Perhaps you can remind us of that. Yeah, so um, study done, published in 2018, September 2018. I like, remember very explicitly those September. And in the journal Cell, which again, this is one of the top medical journals on the planet. And they convincingly showed, because they, they basically broke people into three groups. Um, those who received probiotics after antibiotics, those who received a fecal transplant, of their own microbiome from before the antibiotics. Um, and then those who got neither of those two things and basically were just allowed to recover passively, whatever happens, happens. So now in this study, um, these were healthy, healthy people, so they didn't have an infection. Again, that's the only sort of fair way to do this because then um, you know that they're starting off from a baseline of health. And they all received the same antibiotics. These are antibiotics, Cipro and uh, Fladril, Metronidazole, that are commonly used for gut infections. And the probiotic that they used for people who received the probiotic had 11 different strains. So it was just this one type of probiotic. Now, here, here's what they found. The, the recovery of the microbiome after antibiotics was the fastest among those who received the fecal transplant. Basically, you gave them their own microbiome back and they were good. Now, the issue with this is that I am not aware of any sort of way for us, at least at this point, to store our poop in a fashion that we could give ourselves a fecal transplant if we have to take antibiotics in the future, right? Like this is an unpredictable thing. So it's not super helpful what they found with that right there. Um, but the surprising part, the part that went against everything that conventional wisdom said was that the people who took the probiotics actually had a slower recovery than those who took no probiotic or anything at all. They just passively let their microbiome bounce back. Um, now, this, this was a big surprise. And it changed the way that I approach this issue. And I do want to unpack it if you'll allow me to more in a moment. But before I go there, I think it's very important that I acknowledge some of the limitations of the study that was done. Um, because we need to see more data. <laughs> so does it change some things for me? Yes, because this is the best information that I have at the moment. But this is not written in stone. Right, so and let's perfect. be careful. Yeah. So how many people did uh, they have in the probiotic group? They had eight. So like if you were a parent and I said, well, I'm a pediatrician and I'm going to give your child this thing based upon a study of eight people, would you be excited with me? You might be a little bit upset, right? This is the best data that we have, but it was only eight people. We don't know that this is generalizable. Maybe there was something weird about these eight people. Maybe three of them were outliers. You never know. That's definitely possible. The second thing is that it was only one type of probiotic. It happened to have 11 strains. Um, that doesn't mean that more strains is necessarily a bad thing, but maybe it's a bad thing. Maybe too many strains is a bad thing. It also was bacteria. It was not a yeast. There are forms of yeast probiotics that are beneficial and like very well studied and good for us. So maybe it would be different with a different probiotic. Maybe it would be different with a yeast probiotic. Um, and then the third thing is this hasn't been reproduced anywhere else. Anytime we have research that they've only found it in one place, we got to be a little bit careful bef before we start running wild with it because sometimes we find things at one medical center and who knows, I'm not trying to make accusations that they're making stuff up, but who knows what was going on in that lab that led to this result. We need to see the same thing reproduced in other places. So um, there are some limitations to this study. Now, how do we, how do we pull this together? Uh, like, what do we do with this information? Well, I think that it's important to understand that the outcome that they were using in this study, like what they were looking at, was the recovery of the microbiome. How long does it take for the microbiome to recover? That is a different thing than the reason why many people actually take a probiotic. The reason why many people take a probiotic, Simon, is actually to protect themselves from diarrhea and to protect themselves from the infection that we were talking about earlier, the C. diff infection. 
When you say protect themselves from diarrhea, some antibiotics can cause diarrhea. Many antibiotics can cause diarrhea. And the evidence with probiotics is very clear. Now, some are better than others, but generally speaking, in a systematic review and meta-analysis, antibiotic probiotics taking with and after antibiotics clearly reduce the risk of antibiotic-associated diarrhea. And there's also specific ones um, one of them that I'm a fan of is called Saccharomyces boulardii. And Saccharomyces boulardii uh, has been demonstrated to reduce the risk of antibiotic-associated diarrhea, but it's also been demonstrated to reduce the risk of developing the C. diff infection. That's a yeast-based probiotic. That's a yeast-based probiotic. It's a good yeast. Mm -hmm. So in people who you select a probiotic, the goal is different. The goal is to protect them from these specific things. That's not the same as gut recovery. So how do we how do we deal with this? Okay, here's what we do. Let me just break this down and try to make it simple for people. If uh, you are super young, like you're talking about your kid who's under three, um, or you're super old, or you are high risk for complications because you have other heart other issues that could be heart disease, lung disease, kidney disease, et cetera, right? A, vulner a vulnerable patient, or you have inflammatory bowel disease. Um, these are all people that probably should be taking probiotics. And the other that I would say is if you've ever had a C. diff infection before, then you definitely should be considering probiotics. And how, do, how would those people, before you, you move on, how would they choose a probiotic? Well, you something? want something that's evidence-based. So I, I, there, there are a number of different choices that exist. The Saccharomyces boulardii that I mentioned is widely available. It's not under any patent. And um, so it's not very expensive. And, uh, and it has actually highly compelling evidence to indicate that it works. So guidelines, there are guidelines from the American College of Gastroenterology that actually recommend it. And so on the front of a lot of these is like a CFU colony forming units, I think yep. that stands for. Is that important to look at? It is important. And so the dose, the dose needs to be like basically, as I was mentioning earlier with the DMN, the daily microbiome nutrition supplement, you know, if we want something to work, you should be taking it at the dose that was demonstrated in the clinical studies. Um, that's true of medications, and that's also true of supplements. And so in this case, with the Saccharomyces boulardii, the dose is 500 milligrams. So it's not necessarily represented with the CFUs in the case of Saccharomyces boulardii, but the dose is 500 milligrams is the dose that you want. So now, if you're not one of these people, young, old, tons of comorbidities, inflammatory bowel disease, or a history of C. diff infection, the chances are you probably don't need to take probiotics after antibiotics. Okay, and in the instance that someone does feel compelled to take a probiotic, how long do they take it for? Okay, so if you if you do end up taking a probiotic, um, we're no longer of the frame of mind, based upon what we know, that the probiotic is going to help you recover your microbiome. So we only want to take it for the purpose of protecting ourselves from antibiotic-associated diarrhea or this C. diff infection. So the way that we do this is we take it for the duration that you're on, like you literally start it while you're on the antibiotics and you take it for the duration that you're on the antibiotics and then I would continue it for about a week. And then after that, you just stop. So would it be fair to say, it sounds like the conversation around gut health and diversity has changed a bit over the years. There was a lot of focus on probiotics, which clearly have their place for very specific things, but would it be fair to say now the emphasis really is on prebiotics and the importance of prebiotics for building diversity? Well, here's what we know. I have not seen a study where taking a probiotic has the impact on gut diversity that you can accomplish through dietary strategies. So, and dietary strategies, really what you're talking about are the prebiotics. Mm -hmm. Um, so that's to me where the focus yeah. needs to be. 